Welcome to today's live walkthrough, where we'll delve into the dynamic realm of photo editing on the iPad, comparing two powerful contenders, Adobe Photoshop and Affinity Photo. Join me as we explore their features, user interfaces and overall capabilities, aiming to provide you with insights to help you choose the right tool for your creative endeavours. Let's navigate the digital canvas and uncover the nuances that distinguish these two prominent applications. First, let's dive into Adobe Photoshop for iPad. Known for its industry standard status in desktop photo editing, Photoshop for iPad brings a plethora of familiar tools to the mobile platform. The seamless integration with the Creative Cloud ensures a smooth transition between devices, allowing you to continue your work effortlessly. Photoshop on iPad offers powerful capabilities like layers, masks and extensive range of filters, making it an ideal choice for professionals accustomed to the desktop version. As we navigate through both applications, we'll explore their unique features, workflow efficiency, and how well they adapt to the demands of mobile photo editing. Whether you're a seasoned professional or an aspiring artist, this comparison aims to guide you in selecting the iPad photo editing app that aligns best with your creative vision. I'd like to start by showing you some of the basic features of Adobe Photoshop on the iPad. As you launch Photoshop on the iPad, you can view the home screen of the app, and that's what we're looking at now. From the home screen, you can start creating your composites or documents and proceed to the editing workspace. In the workspace, you can find your favourite Photoshop tools, panels, and other options that will equip you to create composites and retouch your creative work. More Photoshop tools and features are coming to your iPad in future releases. So, starting with the home screen, let's begin our exploration. As with all tools on the screen, a simple tap is all you need. Now we're looking at the home there. The home icon represents the home screen of the app. And there we are, that's the first one at the top, on the left hand side. The Learn that one there, accesses an interactive app tour and hands-on tutorials to help you explore what's different when you use Photoshop on the iPad and understand common workflows. Discover is the next one down where you can view a curated selection of artwork, projects and live streams from other Photoshop users to get inspired and fuel your own creativity. Very interesting there. Quite an extensive list. Now the next one on the left hand side is files. That's your files. Find all your documents in Photoshop on the iPad under the Your Files section. View a list of all saved cloud documents in Photoshop, whether created in Photoshop on your iPad or desktop. And there's what I've saved so far. Shared with you is the next one down. Now nobody's shared any files with me. View where, This is where you view a list of the cloud documents that have been shared with you in Photoshop. Deleted, the next one down. Accidentally deleted a file? No worries. Find a complete list of cloud documents that you have deleted here. You can choose to restore the documents or permanently delete them. The next element down, bottom left, create new. Easily create a new document with the option to name the document, set the canvas dimensions, change orientation, select resolution and choose black, white or transparent background colour. 
You can also explore common re preset canvas options in the print, screen, film, or video categories. It's social, social media, presets for social media, and presets for print. Now, since the last update, the film one has gone. But never mind, let's close all that. Cancel, and we're back to the last one, which is import and open, where you can quickly import and open your documents from the camera roll, files, or take a new photo with your iPad camera. Your imported file converts to a Photoshop cloud document and opens on the canvas. Go back to the home screen and that takes you straight back there. Now the interesting thing with uh, Adobe Photoshop for the iPad, because it automatically saves everything in its cloud document folder, if you don't have the internet, you're going to have some problems. Now, new and upcoming features. View a summary of new features releasing with a new version and what's coming in future. That's the top right hand corner square there. Adobe is building Photoshop with valuable inputs from its large community of users. The recent, which is centre screen there, use the recent section to access all the documents you worked on recently. Now, to get to account settings, tap the profile icon to set your preferences while working with Photoshop on the iPad. That's that one there, and there's all your app settings. Cloud doc, you're online, that's what it tells you there. And PS, on the left hand side, that's home screen. Now you've got get started on the iPad, which is another learning thing, new and incoming features, and there's all my past documents. Let's say I wanted to open the bottom left hand one again, the doors, there we go. And it's open, ready to work on. Now that's a quick look at the interface. As soon as you open a document, you'll enter into the editing workspace and your creative work can begin. So let's open that one there. The canvas displays the area where you interact with your open document. Photoshop on the iPad offers you a context-aware user interface. Core tools and tool options are contextual and surface only when you need them. So let's look at the tool options. If we go to the top, that's the Select or Move tool. You can control the settings of your selected tools using the tool options. Tap the tool icon to bring up the tool options. Now I've just tapped the move one and there's some options. Auto select layer on the canvas. Individual layer or group. Now I just want individual layer. And you can see that with that selected, it selects the canvas, but it also selects the first layer. Now. On an open document screen, you find the header bar, which is obviously up the top, B, the toolbar, which we just used the first one, C is the tool options, that's the little options that come up beside it, D is the touch shortcut, and E is the task bar, and F is the panel options. There's the panel options over that side and the task bar on the right hand side. You can now see labels added to tool icons in the workspace when working on your images in Photoshop on the iPad. Just hover over the icons and you'll be able to see what the icons mean. This hover, hover mode is not available on lesser powered iPads like mine. Mine doesn't show that, but if you've got one of the new iPads with the M2 uh, chip in it and like that, then you'll be able to see it. Use the colour picker to create colour palettes and swatches and think of new and creative ways to use colour in your creative work. Tap the colour chip to open the colour panel and you'll find the colour picker. And there we go, there, there's the colour picker. And that's selected the colour, you can see it in that round bar there. 
round circle there. From there you can adjust your colours by using the sliders for the HSB, RGB, CMYK or lab colour models to set the background colour and foreground colour. There's background colour and you can see it up the top there. There's the foreground colour. Now let's have a look at the header bar. Let's go back to this, get that off the screen. Across the top of the workspace of an open document, there is from the left the home, and you can see that, the file name, which is untitled in this case, current zoom level, 61%, and then there's undo, which is the left facing arrow, and redo, the right facing arrow. Cloud Docs Help, which is the little cloud shape thing there, it says you're online. Well, isn't that lovely? And G is Share, well that's in big lettering there, so you can see that quite clearly. H is Send To, which is, you can see the box of the up arrow. Help is the question mark, and J is the App Settings, and that's the App Settings one there. Now A, is the home back button to switch back to the home screen from the editing workspace at any time. Straight back to the home screen. And there we go, let's pull that up again. B is file name. Just there, displays the name of the file. Now I can change that. Name of the file that's currently open. See, I can change that, but I won't. I'll just leave that there at the moment because we don't need to mess with that. C is the current zoom level, and I can change that. Let's make it 100%. There we go, it does it instantly. D is undo. Oh, let's go back. No, I haven't got anything I can undo there yet. So all I did was change the size. Now, if I want to reduce that, you can use thumb and finger. You can pinch that in, and it brings it back in. That's fairly standard across most iPads. And D, undo, reverts. E is redo, restore the last action. Cloud Docs help, well we did that. And G is share document. Tap the icon to share your document for collaboration and comments. H is send to. Publish, export, live stream. And I is help. Find all your help resources in one place under the help menu. There you go. You can browse through tutorials, take a tour, view gestures and shortcuts, post to the community and share feedback. And J of course is the app settings. Now we did all that. Now we've got the toolbar. A is move, move selections and layers. That one there. See how I've just moved that off to one side? Well, let's move that off and use the return button. There we go, just puts it back. B is crop and rotate. Scale and rotate, skew, distort, perspective and cancel. Choose to rotate and center. C is transform. Apply various transform operations to the selected layer or object. D are selection tools. Make a selection with the selection tools. Now you can see there's a little down facing arrow there. There's our selection tools. Lasso, object selection, quick selection, marquee rectangle, mark ellipse and magic wand. You can also use the Select Subject and Remove Background Actions to make a selection. Just tap on that, takes it back. Now in Brush, apply Brush Strokes and Control Settings. Now there's our Brush Strokes there, and you can change the size of the brush and settings. Different brushes there, let's just tap that. The Eraser. And we've got roundness, angle, flow, smoothing, all the options there on that little dots. And there's the size there of the eraser. 
G is the clone. Retouch and fix imperfections with spot healing brush. Healing brush, that's that one there. Clone tools. They're very interesting to work with. H is fill. Or adjustment tools. Fill the active selection. Ah, oh, there we go, we've missed one. Adjustment tools is there. Fill tools. Fill the active selection with the foreground colour using paint bucket and gradient tools. So you can fill that one with a gradient, and you can see I've got a gradient in there. There's the crop tool. I'll cancel that. There's the text tool. And you can see that's put lorem ipsum in there. Let's make the colour red so we can see it. And don't cancel, just get back out of there and there's some text in there. Now because I've got this set in landscape mode, if I turn that up you can see that one there, I can add photos and files to that. But let's turn that back because what you need to do there is just scroll that up a little bit. There's the eyedropper there, we can select what colour we want. You can see the colour changing up the top there. There it is there. You can change the position, foreground colours at the top, background colours at the bottom, which makes more sense really. Now let's go, let's scroll that back down. So I've got the move tool selected. I want that layer there, now that layer is selected. If I want the layer below it selected, I just tap the layer. And there's that background layer there which is right at the, the bottom of the stack, if you like. Now, I've just reduced the size of that and moved it across the screen. Let's go back to the text. And I can change, put what I like in there, cancel, and so on. Back to the Move tool. Select the layer and all is good. Now that's a quick look at the toolbar on that side. What we've got over the other side are the layers tool. Comment to share with other people. Information, document properties. New layer, adjustment layer, you can add layers in there. You can turn layers on or off. And that one there, filters and adjustments, Gaussian blur, liquify, invert, auto tone, auto contrast, and so on. Now there's a whole list under those little buttons there. Delete mask, flatten, load as selection, apply, add mask to selection, subtract, Intersect and Refine Edges, any of those under those three ellipses there, three dots. There we go. Now there's a, a brief view of the layers and that's the one there that's selected. You can see, let's select the layer below it by simply tapping on it and there's the text layer. Now, if you don't want to work with that anymore and you've done enough, you tap the home icon and you're back to the home screen. Let's finish with Photoshop for the iPad right there. Okay, now let's move on to Affinity Photo for iPad. Let's get started with Affinity Photo 2 for iPad. With this overview of the product, its user interface and key features, Upon opening Affinity Photo, you're greeted with its home screen, just as we see here. Use the icons on the left to create, open or manage documents. Tap New and then Document to create a blank document. 
Okay, let's create a blank document. When editing a document, return to the home screen by tapping the button in the workspace's top left corner. Return to documents you've created or opened previously, but not closed, by tapping Live Docs, and that's what it defaults to. Simply tap one's thumbnail to continue working on it. You can also save and close documents from here. Tap on one to open that document. Close, go back there. If you've closed the document, tap open and then open document. And if you've saved it to somewhere else, let's go find something in Dropbox. Images under 100 is an image there. Now it happens to be in a directory. I've just pulled it up and there it is there. Look at that, isn't that nice? You can also explore professional samples and get further help with your app's features from the home screen. Creating a new document from, document from scratch is perfect for digital artists with a composite project in mind, where photography can be merged with creative design. Opening an image. You can open an existing image using the open button and then navigating to your image in a specified folder, like that one there which is what I just did. For image formats such as JPG or TIFF, TIFF, your image will open in the default photo persona. However, for RAW files, you'll see your image opening in a RAW processing workspace called Develop Persona, which brings us to what personas are and how they can be used in your creative workflow. Personas are Affinity's unique approach to digital image manipulation workflow. Think of personas as different digital workspaces where different aspects of photo editing and digital art are addressed. Tap on that and there's our three, four personas there. Photo, liquefied, develop, tone mapping and export. For the most part, Affinity users spend most of their time in the photo persona, that's the default one, where the bulk of your core photo editing tools and features can be accessed. The photo persona, here you'll find the core photo editing tools, including access to adjustments, layers, brushes, filters, as well as other functionality. Let's open that one there. The user interface can be perceptually divided into the following main sections. The center area, where the main image opened and ready for editing, and that's the one there. The left area, hosting the core tools, that's that area there. The menus at the top left, personas, that's those ones there. Document, edit, personas, Document, Edit and Selections. There's Document, there's Edit, and there's Selections. Panels on the right, including the Color, Layers, Brushes, Adjustments and more. There's Colors, Layers, Brushes, Adjustments and more, and so on down that list. Now the Liquify Persona focuses on the warping of images. It can be used for subtle face and body reshaping and portrait retouch work, very subtle, or for more extreme image distortions. There's the Liquify Persona. It offers a studio environment containing a host of warping specific tools and panels. Apart from the most commonly used push forward tool and push left tool for warping, you can also find the freeze tool here to isolate particular areas for editing. Hardness, opacity and width. And you can see 
the mesh is being moved around there. And it's moved the background. You can, not the building, but the background. That's because I was on that layer, you see. The Thor tool, on the other hand, will remove isolated areas once you have finished editing them. Non-destructive develop persona. Let's go back here and there's the develop persona. The non-destructive develop persona is launched by default when opening a raw file. Here you're invited to develop the unprocessed raw image before manipulating it further in the photo persona. Open, open document. I'm looking, what I'm looking for here is a raw image to see if it opens. Fail to open file, no, sorry. Close without saving, open, open from photos. Will it open a raw file directly? And there it's opened a raw file directly. And you can see in the top left hand corner it says raw. Now, the only way of changing this is to develop it. Here you are invited to develop the unprocessed raw image before manipulating it further in the photo persona. You can see that I'll change exposure, bring up the black points, drop the brightness slightly, enhance the contrast, enhance the clarity. Bring up the vibrance. Drop the tone there a little bit. Bring up the shadows. Bring up the highlights. Completely change the image. And then you develop the image. And there it is. Any changes applied through the persona can be non-destructive and are loaded as a raw layer. Being non-destructive, you can redevelop at any time, so I can go back to that and redevelop it. To do so, ensure to set your layer as raw embedded or linked, which can be done via the option on the context toolbar. The tone mapping persona, dedicated primary, primarily, sorry, for 32-bit HDR files. The tone mapping persona is typically used to manipulate either a number of images taken with bracketed exposures or a single image. This persona is selected to work on high dynamic range images so they can be shown on a display that has a lower dynamic range. Now this is this comes into the open OCIO uh, area. There's one there. Photo iPad converted this document to default. You can see it's it's got quite a different layout. It's the tone mapping persona is useful to work with images of challenging scenes, i.e. with clipped highlights or where there's too much contrast. And you can see that one there is quite special. Your workspace is efficient and customizable. Familiar touchscreen gestures are used to interact with the document view and the surrounding interface. For example, you can tap to select an existing object on the page or a tool you want to use, drag to create a new object or position for an existing one, and pinch to zoom in or out of the page. Well, let's have a look at the flowers one. See, I can zoom out or zoom out or zoom in there. Regularly used commands are always at your fingertips by swiping three fingers down on the document view 
to reveal the customizable quick menu. Three fingers, and there it is there. Just a quick tap with three fingers. Menus at the top left provide access to personas, and you've got all sorts of groups there. There's group, select, rasterize to mask, new pixel layer. There's lots of quick menus there that you can use. Saving, exporting, and layers, you can set that as you like. Do the right is the context toolbar for quick access to important settings for your current tool or selection. At the far right are menus for zoom level, design aids, preview mode, and snapping options. Studio panels containing more settings are accessed by tapping their icons on the right. Those ones there, for example, there's filters, there's effects layers, there's the text layers. Metadata, channels. Let's scroll that up a little bit. There's stock images. You can go and find stock images there. Resource manager. At the top right of each panel, use the pin to determine whether it stays open or automatically closes when you work in the document view. There's the pin and we can make sure that stays open or not. Manage the front to back order, opacity and blend mode of layers. Let's find our layers panel again and there they all are. There's lots of them there. You can see that little arrow moves them up and down. You'll use this panel a lot, so if it's pinned open, switch to its compact mode to give yourself more room to work on your document. Now that's there we go. Now, if you touch the document, it goes off. Put that on and pin it on. Now, if I touch the document, it doesn't go off. You see, the layer panel stays there. You'll use that panel a lot. Switch to its compact mode to give yourself more room to work on your document. There we go. All the essential tools for creating designs are shown on the left of the workspace. Some are grouped behind a single icon, either that of the first tool or the last used tool in the group. Some of those have little down arrows on them, like the brush tool or the eraser brush. There's a, it's got a couple of options below that. The burn brush, there's half a dozen options below that one. The clone brush. Different options below that one. In all the other personas you'll find, you'll be offered a different set of tools appropriate to that persona. Here's a tip. As you swap between tools, the context toolbar appearing directly above your workspace will change and offer settings for the newly active tool. You can see up the top, each is each one of those that I tap, the options up there change as well. The command controller gives you access to many alternative behaviors for tools and objects and has the effect of working as a keyboard, um, um, a keyboard command controller. To show or hide it, tap toggle command controller on the document menu. That's the document menu up there. Toggle command controller and it puts it there. Dragging this center button over one of its four modifying buttons, equivalent to the equivalent to the Command, Alt, uh, Control, and Shift keys on a Mac keyboard, affects actions for as long as it's held there. Or you can drag to a modifier's outer edge and then release to lock the modifier on. Tap the center and there's your keys. You can hold that key on. That, of course, is the command key. And hold it off. For example, you can use the you can use the alt key down modifier with the pen tool to draw sharp cusp corners, the up modifier to draw straight brush strokes, 
and the left modifier to toggle between selecting objects when the mark encompasses or intersects them. Position the controller wherever you want by long pressing its centre until it pulses and then dragging it. You can see it's pulsing there now and I can drag it down there or put it up there or put it up there or put it down there out of the way. Easily. Cropping and straightening. That's that tool there. The crop tool draws a rectangular or square area on your image that will redefine your new document's dimensions and discard the area outside the drawn crop area. Use the tool to manipulate image composition either by using unconstrained or specific built-in aspect ratios, i.e. 4 to 3 or fixed print sizes, 6 by 4. It's unconstrained up there at the moment. Original ratio. And as I drag it in, you can see the original ratio is holding. Now up here, you'll see there's a tick mark. Now that's applied that to the image, and there's the image there. If needed, straightening a photo is easily performed by se selecting Straighten on the context toolbar and then dragging along a line that you consider to be your new horizon. That's within that. There's the straighten menu. And there's a new line. And if that image had been slightly wonky, then it would have straightened it. Removing unwanted contact. The in-painting brush tool is frequently used by portrait photographers to remove skin blemishes or by landscape photographers to clear unwanted objects such as power lines. Very good for that. Let's go back here to the home screen. We'll open a blank document. Just pinch it down with my fingers. Let's um, just took me a moment to get that up. There we go. B O R T R A I T. There's a portrait. It's looking in Pixabay for a portrait. There we go, loading a portrait. The internet is rubbish today, I might add. My goodness, that's hopeless, isn't it? Image. Center the image. Rasterize the image. There we go, that's brought the image down to size. Go back to there. Let's go find the in-painting brush. Clone brush, in-painting brush. Now what I want to do is just remove a little bit of that background there. You can see 
I very roughly removed the piece of hair across the girl's mouth. There we go, that's got rid of those strands of hair that were just blowing across her mouth. The tool is non-destructive. You can remove content by painting with it on a separate layer that targets the unaltered image below it. To do so, select Current Layer and Below. There's Current Layer, but Current Layer and Below, which is what I should have done in the first place. Now I could begin painting and it only affects that strand of hair there. And if I go there, you can see that. There we go. Let's get out of that anyway. Masking. For com composting work, masking allows you to make visible only a part of an image, pixel layer or adjustment. You can create masks from pixel selections or by painting in or out content on a mask layer using grayscale raster brushes. Masks can also be created from channels, created from luminosity, created as live masks to target hue, luminosity or frequency. Compound masks combined using Boolean operations such as add and subtract. Inverted or grouped masks, isolated masks switched on or off according to their state, masking using pixel selections. Let me show you that. Let's bring that down. Now what I want to do here is create a square and we've got that square there. Bring that down. Not quite what I was trying to do. And there we go, put the image inside the mask. Now by selecting the image again, undo that, select the image and the move tool, then I can center the image inside the mask. That's what that is. Making selections can be one of the most demanding parts of image editing. However, using the Smart Selection Brush or Flood Select tool, you'll be able to precisely cut out a subject from its background. Tip. To mask a pixel selection, tap on the plus symbol on the Layers panel, then Mask Layer. For separating complex edges, i.e. hair or fur from backgrounds, you can refine the selection. For applying adjustment filters to specific image areas, after making your pixel selection and applying an adjustment or filter to it, you can immediately restrict its effect to just that selection area. Unlike other applications, Affinity Photo doesn't require clipping masks to adjustment layers and live filters as they include their own masks by default, mask layers for painting in and out images areas. A classic composting technique is to paint a placed composite image back into a scene by using a mask layer. You can create a new empty mask layer by tapping on the plus symbol and selecting empty mask layer on the layers panel. There's the plus symbol just there, see? And there's your various mask layers. This lets you mask the previously selected target layer by painting on the mask in levels of grayscale to reveal or hide content. White to fully reveal, black to completely conceal. The layers panel lets you arrange content into separate layers in a layer stack. In doing so, you can selectively control content visibility. 
group content, apply adjustments and filters, as well as apply layer properties such as opacity, blend modes and blend ranges. Let's have a look at this one. This one has lots of layers in it, as you can see there, and you can turn them off. You can see how that's turned that on, turned that one on. That's a mask on there. Then there's a, a bugs in there somewhere, and then there's some curves, and then we can turn that one on, and so forth. The types of layers that can be created are pixel layer, fill layer, pattern layer, pattern layer from selection, mask layer, empty mask layer, compound mask layer, hue live mask layer, luminosity live mask layer, a bandpass live mask layer, and empty group. Opacity. The opacity setting on the layers panel lets you adjust how visible the layer is. My goodness, haven't we got a lot of things going on here? Let's have a look at this one. Back here we go. Let's reduce that in size slightly. There we go. Opacity. There's the opacity there. Normal. Let's give it 20% opacity, and there, that's practically faded it out. Set that back up to 100%. Oh, I had it at 100% by just scrolling up on that. That's changing that to 100%. Good, that's what we want. Blend modes, normal, reflect, glow, erase, darken. That darkened that slightly, you can see that, multiply. There is a whole, um, a whole tutorial on this. And there's dark and color blend mode. There is a comprehensive number of blend modes available in Affinity Photo, and they are a powerful feature to control how pixel color and tone are blended together across layers. You can access blend modes directly on the layers panel adjacent to the opacity setting. As you cycle through them, they preview in real time, giving you an instant feedback on what the current layer looks like with them applied. Blend ranges are Affinity Photo's version of Adobe's Blend if set to cut set of tools. They give you full tonal control over blending using two graphs that define how the current source layer's tone blend with those of underlying layers. You can access blend ranges options by tapping layer options, the ellipses that's there, and there's the blend ranges source and destination. So we can change the source. That's really washed it out, isn't it? And there's put a curve in it. And the destination, well, we haven't got a destination because it's only a white panel behind it. The blend range graphs are then accessible at the bottom of the panel. Let's exit out of all of that. Go back to there. Brushes, Affinity Photo comes packed with a multitude of brushes. There's our brushes panel there. And there are more brushes there then you will need in a lifetime. It comes with a default set of brushes and you can add your own brushes. The Affinity apps have native AF brushes brush format, but will also import ABR brush files, including those with dynamics. Each brush can be modified by swiping left on a brush entry on the panel. As you paint brush strokes, alter brush width and hardness on the fly by dragging outwards from the command controller's center button to the space between the up arrow and the alt keys. The buttons will highlight in blue when you do so. Whilst having them pressed, drag up and down to change on screen the hardness of your selected brush or left right to modify its width. Now that takes a little bit of getting used to. Let's go back to there. Adjustments. Adjustments can be applied non-destructively to your photo for creative or corrective purposes. They're independent of non-destructive layers, meaning you can modify their settings at any time without affecting your layer content. 
Typically, tonal adjustments such as brightness, contrast, curves or levels are used, while colour adjustments like HSL and recolour are popular. The black and white adjustments can be used creatively. Any adjustment layer has, has self-masking properties, meaning that pixel selections are converted to masks on adjustment layer creation. Alternatively, you can paint in grayscale directly on the adjustment layer. Let me show you an adjustment layer on a different image. Let's go to the almonds. There's an adjustment layer and you can change that to black and white with an adjustment layer. Adjustments can be accessed from the adjustment panel. They're also available on various other panels within the develop persona. That's got rid of that. Live filters include blush, blur, include, sorry about that. Live filters include blur, sharpen, distortion, noise, and edge filters for more creative photo editing. Adjustments, filters. There's add, you can change them to live filters, which are non destructive. All filter layers are independent, non-destructive layers that have self-masking properties. By default, you are presented with all filters available via the filters panel. To include live filters, toggle add live filters at the top right, which is what I did, on and on and off. Incredibly sharp looking outcomes are often produced by taking a series of photos of different focal points within the scene, then merged together into one. After developing and preparing your raw files in the develop persona and saving them, you can combine them into one by going to the home screen, choosing new, then selecting new focus merge. You have panorama stitching as well. And you have high dynamic range, that's HDR ranges. Such as that one there. That's a HDR image currently saved as a OCIO type file. And you create them by tapping new and then new HDR image and you can export to different formats. Let's go back here. Take the flowers, go up to there, export, and you've got PNG, JPG, GIF, TIFF, XR, HDR, TGA, JPEG, WebP, SVG, EPS, PDF, PSD. Lots of different export options. The dialog that appears lets you export the whole doction, the whole document. Sorry, let's cancel that and go back to there. There's the export menu, export all, cancel. Keep doing that, don't I? Background, PNG, slice options, and so forth. Selection only, the current layer with it's in a selection bounding box. Alternatively, you can use the export persona, which I'm looking at, because what we looked at first was the export option there. Presets, pixel format, resample, area, file name, colors, and all of those options there. You can export any draw and rectangle area and is great for banners, on the fly crops and more using the slice tool. But you can also just click the share button and save the image to Apple Photos, which is where it will natively save that if that's all you do. Then you cancel that back at your image. Then in Apple Photos, you'll have that image in Apple Photos. Let me see if I can quickly find it. There we go. And there it is there. Apple Photos.
there we go. Now that's all there is to Affinity Photo. Well, I say that's all there is. That's a quick look at Affinity Photo for iPad version 2. It's a very powerful piece of software, has no subscription, and in fact it's currently on sale. And these sales usually appear around Black Fridays, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, special special times of the year like that. Keep your eye out if you if you want um, a reduced version, and they're usually around forty dollars, which is not very much at all. And that's all you pay. There's no subscription. You're not paying every month. You don't have to have an internet connection to use them. So they're great for on the road. I've used this that many times, and I've been traveling and you can be up a mountain pass you can be in a restaurant you can be in a bar you can be sitting by the pool sipping on a margarita and you can just use your images that you've just taken as photos and send them off um, perhaps to the office you never know where you're going to need it very good okay let's call it quits there shall we I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and please subscribe. I really appreciate it when you do.